It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to the VolQuest podcast, the Smoky Mountain Organics VolQuest podcast, East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store focusing on natural products and organic remedies. Three locations right here in East Tennessee, one in Knoxville. Of course, you know by now it's across the street from the Trader Joe's, 8018 Kingston Pike, and you can always shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. We got Rob Lewis, Brent Hubs, and Austin Price. And a quick reminder, go ahead and follow, subscribe, like, comment, do all that good stuff on the YouTube channel. Camp, we're now in week two. We got a scrimmage coming up later today. There's tons of stuff going on, so be sure to follow us on the YouTubes by searching VolQuest on there as well. All right, guys, so we are beginning week number two of fall camp. Uh, we're going to learn uh, an awful lot uh, following today's scrimmage number one. But Brent Hubbs, where would you kind of assess where Tennessee is at this point in fall camp heading into the new season? Oh, I think probably where you thought they would be. I mean, the questions that you had going in remain. They won't get answered until they've scrimmaged, uh, particularly in the line of scrimmage. Um, you know, a couple of surprises. I certainly did not expect to hear anybody mention Dominique Bailey's name uh, in the preseason as Rodney Garner did on Monday. So, uh, that's obviously a pleasant surprise. Um, you know, uh, did not expect him to be settled at left tackle here. I think the other surprise is Dylan Sampson for me. Uh, but I think the bigger questions, Rob, that I had going into fall camp as we head into week two, surprisingly remain those questions. Cause I, I just don't think you're going to answer them until you get into, uh, you know, scrimmage type settings and sort of see where people are. Yeah, I'm with you and, Probably for me, I mean, the the biggest question was probably just, you know, the secondary, the defensive backfield. You know, what I don't, and I don't know, Hubbard, that that we'll have any concrete answers tomorrow. I mean, we'll probably find out who played, maybe get it, get some hits about the pecking order. But uh, you know, that seems pretty unsettled. And you you touched on left tackle. It did not sound last week like Glenn El- Ellerby was going to, you know, rush the situation just to just to name a starter and. Um, I don't know that we're going to find that one out after the first scrimmage tomorrow either. Yeah, for me, I, I'm not sure you'll know the answer to the question until you actually get into the season and you're not going against each other. But, I mean, I, I still think the biggest question mark for me on this whole team is who starts a left tackle. It's not even close, actually. I mean, I think Tennessee can mix and match a little bit at linebacker and they – are they going to be great? Probably not. Are they going to be a little better than last year? Yes. I think they have more quality depth in the back end. Um, are they going to be great? No, but again, I think they'll be better than they were a year ago. Um, you know, running back, I actually think they're okay at running back. They're just real thin. Like, I mean, like, I don't, there's no like superstar, but they have a nice stable of guys. Um, it's just not as many as you would like. Um, it, but I, to me, it's left tackle because if, if Mincy and Crawford don't prove they can play it, what do you do? Like, well, you're going you know I mean? like, to you're going to flip Darnell to left and play Dane Davis at right tackle. So the question, which is not the ideal scenario, that's not no. where they want to go, but that's that would be their answer there, and that is with a guy who started at right tackle in Dane Davis, and a guy who started a lot of football in, in Darnell Wright. I'm with you. I think the left tackle spot is the is a huge question mark. I start to wonder a little bit about them, Eric, in the defensive interior. And, and and listen, I know Amari Thomas is going to play. He played a good bit last year, um, but who's the other guy? Is is it Terry? Uh, I mean, Bryson Eason got all the praise, but I don't think anybody's ready to anoint Bryson Eason anything right now. Although, other than a talented guy, uh, who is the other tackle? And uh, I mean, Matthew Butler was a snap eater. I mean, it'll take two guys to replicate the snaps he played a year ago. So I, I think that's a May maybe as big of a question mark as left tackle is right now for this football team. And and until Elijah Simmons shows he can do it, yeah. right yeah, now not. he just proves to be just a, a, a big body that isn't proven he can do it. Here's yeah, what I, I, I don't think you can buy that stock right now. Yeah, I mean Rodney Garner chat up with us and at the podium for what fifteen minutes. Not one mention of Elijah Simmons. And uh, I th- I think that's a little telling. But to answer your question, Brent. I, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, but the way I look at the defensive tackle position, it's yeah, you're one A starter. If you want to call him that, it's Amari Thomas. Okay. He's played a lot. He played a lot as a freshman, played a lot last year. I think he's gotten a little bit better. He's probably your best one. But really, those two spots, I, I just, 
you know, Craw Garland is going to play. DJ Terry is going to play. Um, you know, Latrell Bumpus, though, he's more of an in. You know, when healthy, he can slide in and play a little bit. You know, Bryson Eason is going to play. We'll see how good he is. But I think it was encouraging, at least from Monday's standpoint, or two, or yeah, Monday's standpoint, that uh, you got a mention of Dominic Bailey because, like you said, Brent, I was not, I was shocked when I heard his name. And yeah, but and that's, Rodney, a, that's an outside guy. I mean, I think he gets back to. What's the old Rob Lewis? What's the old Haywood Harris line? You know, God rest his soul. If if you can't run the dive play and you can't stop the dive play, you're not going to beat anybody. Haywood can, Harris. Can, can this team stop the dive play? And, and I think that's do they have enough bodies in there who can do that? Because they're replacing essentially 800 snaps of a guy who did it a year ago. I mean, he he basically played the whole game a year ago. Matthew Butler did, and and played it at a level that I think Rob Rodney Garner expressed to you in a question you asked on Monday, probably did it better than Rodney even appreciated at the time it was happening a year ago. Rob, yeah, thought- Rod, Rodney, Rob, Rod, I'm, I'm gonna get this in before Rob goes. Rodney, Rodney missed a real chance to look at Rob and go, "You do not replace a Gary Bertier," and he just <laughs> did not. <laughs> Oh, AP. Yeah, I thought that was pretty telling. And I mean, and and showed you the kind of respect I think that Coach Garner had for for Matthew and, and and what he got done. You know, not just the the level play and how much he played, but off the field, what a what an asset he was in the meeting room. And um, you know, I thought I thought Coach Garner was pretty straightforward and, and open about saying, you know, we don't have that guy right now. We don't, you know, we we have a leadership void. You know, he's got good guys. He has good kids. But you know, Byron Young is not the not that kind of guy. Omari Thomas has probably not played enough yet to to really have that kind of respect. And I, I'm with you, Hubbard. I think that's you know, I, I think they've got some candidates, but they just don't have you know one or two guys. I, I think you can just hang your hat on in in the defensive interior and and feel like you know these are high level SEC players. I think that's going to kind of work itself out as the season goes along, kind of like what AP said. I mean, you're going to you're going to figure out who's going to play and who can move the needle a little bit. And there might we we talk about depth, we want quality depth. There might be a lot of guys that play those positions, but you know, hopefully that you know they're getting better as the camp weeks go on and they can actually do some things. That that's a concern for sure. Kind of where you at right there. Also for me, just kind of spitballing here, and I know there's a plan at wide receiver. You've got you know Cedric Tillman on one side. You got Jalen Hyatt in the slot, and you feel good about the slot. But I mean that other outside receiver spot, Brew McCoy a little bit banged up right now, and you think that you know he can once he clears that hurdle can play that. But they're real thin out there. I mean Walker Barrel's been playing a little bit out there, but he's more of a slot. I think he's going to play outside. I don't think Nimrod nor Webb are ready to go right now. And you know, Ramel Keaton was not Kelsey Pope's best friend at practice on Monday morning. I think that that position in itself is a huge question mark right now, still in the second week. Yeah, I mean, but I think that's kind of the – I think that position is going to be that way until they go play. Um, because, you know, until somebody goes and proves it in a game. I, I've said it for months, and I believe this. I'm not I'm not concerned – that concerned about them at the wide receiver spot. And, and it's based on the evidence of this offense that of guys that have produced early in their careers or guys who weren't the most highly acclaimed guys, Austin – that produced big time in this offense. They, they got guys out there that can run. Okay, I, I saw enough last year that that Josh Heupel is going to get those guys open schematically, right? I mean, no offense, but I mean, he had some guys at Missouri that were just kind of just fast bodies that were not were, that were never quote polished receivers um, who performed well and put up big numbers. So, uh, to, to me, the the left tackle position on offense is the biggest offensive concern. And my biggest defensive concern is the defensive interior at defensive tackle. I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there because just to reiterate Hubs' point, I'm call. I, I'm buying all the Jalen Hyatt stock right now. I just think he he has a different attitude. We talked about it in spring. He's carried it through summer and into fall camp. I'm buying stock in him. The best thing that happened to Jalen Hyatt, in my opinion, guys, is squirrel white. Brew McCoy, you know, Chaz Nimrod, Caleb Webb, these guys coming in. I, I know some are outside guys and not all of them are slot guys, but but there's no there's no just, well, it's my position. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're going to have to go earn it, and and, ha- and there's some competition there. And I, I think that's, that's the biggest thing when you talk about what's going on at defensive tackle. You know, there's probably not been enough competition there 
to push a guy, right? Like Elijah Simmons probably by natural thought, hey, Matthew Butler's gone. I played the most snaps of anybody else last year. I'll slide right in there, you know. Um, I think Tyler Barron's a better football player because there's competition at that spot. You know, whether it's Dominique Bailey, whether it's Tyree West, the, the, there's somebody pushing somebody there. I think that's the best. That's the other thing that's happened to Jalen Wright or Jalen Hyatt, excuse me, is that there's some competition that says, you know, if I don't get my stuff together, then I'm going to get passed because they didn't have They didn't have any problem letting me stand and watch it, watch him play last year. They were perfectly comfortable playing three wide receivers this past season. So I'm not just going to automatically get in there and, and be a part of it. So um, I, I think that's helped. And I think Jalen Hyatt's matured some. I, I think he's, I think he's kind of crossed over that line from a maturity standpoint that he's doing the things he needs to do mentally and physically to be ready to play. I think too. Yeah. I was going to say even before the Bruce McCoy got to campus, even before squirrel White got here in spring, Kind of what he said to us when he when he first time he met with us uh, before spring practice, his mind wasn't right. He wasn't in it, and he got passed and he got benched. And so before even the competition really began for this year, he knows what it feels like to be sitting there on the outside looking in, only getting a couple of snaps per game, and he didn't like it. So yeah, I would agree. I think it's a combination of both of those. And I mean, he looks good out there. He's he's running good routes. I've seen him make some a, a lot of good catches, and of course the potential has always been there. So. Um, excited to see what Jalen Hyatt can do this year, without a doubt. Heading into scrimmage number one, that's today, obviously. Let's run down the injuries. There are some of the guys who have been banged up a little bit. Anything of note? A lot of this is precautionary, and that's what I try to stress a lot in my in my practice records. But, uh, you know, AP, as you pointed out, right before camp began, you have Jalen Wright, who has been dressed out. He's been out there with everybody the entire time, but he's not been going through individual. He remains off to the side a little bit. Brew McCoy, the last two days, have been off to the side a little bit. Christian Charles ditched his uh, orange or his red jersey, and now he's he's full padded with the rest of them. So that's a good sign. Jerome Carvin was back at practice after missing two. Uh, that was on Monday. Anything of note? Kamal Haddon has missed the last couple of days. Anything of note? Injury concern? No, I, you know I will say this about. Jalen Wright, I mean, everybody has raved about the offseason he's had, whether it be current players, coaches, they've really been bragging on him. But this wasn't ideal to start on the shelf for the first two weeks of fall camp, not when you had a new body in Lynn J. Dixon. Obviously, you, you've seen Dylan Sampson get a lot of praise from, from people. Um, you know, obviously, Justin William Thomas is right there, and Jabari Small is already, you know, kind of the, the, the pseudo starter anyway. So, you know, Jalen Wright's got to be chomping at the bit to get back out there because he had such a nice offseason. You hate to kind of have it, you know, hit a wall because of, you know, you know, he got a little bit of banged up. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, th- I, I think it's important that he gets well. Um, I think it's important, Rob, that Kamal Haddon gets well. Yes. Um, you, you need to see you need to see where he's at. I think all of us talked about, hey, we, we believed he was going to be a starter, um, and, and maybe he is, but – you know, Christian Charles is going to stay out there at corner. I think Turnage may stay out there at corner. Suddenly, there's a little more competition out there. Um, so, for, for some of those guys, I mean, Jerome Carvin doesn't have anything to worry about, right? I mean, he, he can walk around in his Crocs if he wants to uh, later today um, and, and admire the construction in, in Neyland Stadium and, and all as well. A couple other guys that are banged up need to get – Need to get well. and need need to get out of the tub. I'm not saying they're soft or there's they're not hurt because they are, but that they, they got to get back through it and get back on the practice field because some of those guys are in some competition settings. Rob. Yeah, I mean, I think especially in the secondary. I mean, we've talked about it a lot, but you know, I I think they have real competition out there for the first time, you know, in, in a while. I mean, think back what three or four years ago, I and mean, Bryce Thompson and Alante Taylor just kind of got handed starting corner jobs and you know it's i don't know that there's been legit competition at, at both corner spots for for some time and right now you know i guess you maybe pencil warren burrell in there just because he's played a bunch at, at least to, to begin the year and um but you're you're right i mean turnage uh charles they have a lot of bodies in the secondary you got the two transfers you know that, that figure in somewhere I, I guess star for Turrentine and, and Walker, but you know, it, it looks like a big question mark, but I, I feel like they have some ability back there. You feel a lot better about the secondary now than you did in spring. That's for sure. Of course, in spring, no one was practicing. They were all her, but even going back to the music city bowl, when you just felt like, 
I mean, gosh, well, they were all had, hurt then too. <laughs> you had no options. You had Theo Jackson having to go there and play quarterback the last couple of series of the game. So, um, with, with the scrimmage being today, and I don't think we're going to find out anything groundbreaking. But Brent, Austin, Rob, you guys have been doing this for a lot longer than me. What are some things that uh, you, you want to hear if you're a Tennessee fan from Josh Heupel? Uh, me and Hubbard have been doing hours. it so long. We used to we can remember we used to wa- get to watch a scrimmage. <laughs> and, take, did. And, and and Austin was there too. I think you saw a few. I mean, I oh. remember when you used to keep stats. They handed out a stats, stat baby. sheet John at the Pan- end. John Panner would be set up here. He'd hand out stats. Daryl Vereen, five carries, 43 yards, <laughs> and he shook somebody for a touchdown. I can't even imagine the that. Like, the next spring. Gerald, Gerald um, Williams, 27 tackles, <laughs> three quarterback sacks. I mean, Rob, stats for a scrimmage. he never scrimmaged. He just went straight from his 14 stops before he got here right to the game field. Um, <laughs> Edric Lofton, estimated time of arrival today, ETA. 624. <laughs> yeah, Eugene. Um, I, you know, I, don't, I think it's twofold. I think you'd love to hear good things about the defense because you don't worry about, like, the offense. But I don't think you really want to hear uh, Byron Young had 44 sacks. Because, I mean, like, you, you're going to go up against quality edge guys around the league, um, and, and I think you want to be able to protect. Now, here's the deal. Live game action, can a quarterback elude versus, you know, they get with an, you know, a stone's throw and they blow it dead with the with the red jerseys. It's, there's a little bit of difference in that. But I, I think you want to hear that the defense is making some plays. You want yeah, to hear for me- that some of those young guys or a Juju Mitchell are making some plays. Yeah, for me, for me, it's about individuals. Uh, when you look at this, I mean, R- Rob, it's what freshman shows they can do something right. Um, who looks like they're going to be able to ha- to, to help? Um, th- that that's what it's about for me more more than you know position groups or, or anything like that. But it's about what individual stands up and makes the plays, particularly a young guy. Because today's when you start to learn whether a guy can really help you this fall or he not or, or not help you. Because going through drills is one thing, but uh, scrimmaging is a whole different animal. Yeah, and I mean we're not too far. I mean, you know, what is kickoff? Twenty twenty three days away. I mean, that, that seems like a long time, but it's it's not going to be. I, I would say it, it it'll be a pretty short period of time before they really start trimming things down and you know know who the guys are going to get on the bus and you know who who's the two deep who's the who you know and then who's moving over to scout team. So tomorrow tomorrow's a big day for the youngsters. Um, and just individually, I mean, I, I mean, Hubbard, you know him better than I do, but Ronnie Garner does not throw around compliments, you know, easily. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see if, if the Dominic Bailey talk is, is that real, you know, does he have any buzz coming out tomorrow? Because I'm like you, Hubbard. That was that's one of the most surprising things at fall camp so far is to hear Coach Garner drop that name. And you know, offensively, I just other than left tackle, I, I don't think they have a lot of concerns i mean i'm I'm, you know you you say they don't have any receivers and put up numbers outside of tillman but i'm with you hubber after after last year i don't that's not a spot i I think i'll ever worry about while while high pulls calling the shots yeah i mean i think for a guy like miles campbell eric this is a big scrimmage um you know then then where does a guy like josh joe's you know joshua joseph can he help you austin's mentioned mitchell i mean i mean just some some individuals that that you feel like coming out of the out of the first scrimmage, you say, "Hey, this guy can help us." You know, th- this guy. The moment wasn't too big. He didn't when there wasn't a coach right next to him telling him what to do. You know, he, he handled he handled that situation well, and uh, all those you know all those types of things. It's never going to be perfect, but um, th- for me, this is a lot about trying to figure out who who can. Who can really help? Who can really help you? And, and I've been around. And we won't get to see it. I mean, I've also been around enough to know that you do not make crazy judgments off of a scrimmage because, um, as Austin said, you know sometimes they're blowing a the play dead. Um, I mean, I'll go back to the to the '98 scrimmage. I've probably told the story a million times. I mean, that night scrimmage in Neyland Stadium when watched. I don't think the offense made a first down. Now, Peyton Manning had just left. T. Martin was here. He's in a green jersey. So they're blowing the whistle all the time. So you didn't get to see his scrambling ability. And then what we learned about, oh, I don't know, week three, week four of the football season is that defense was legit, which you didn't know how good that defense was going to be at, at that point in time. I mean, they were a, there was a lot of different parts moving along out there. So I think you got to be careful not to cast too big of a judgment uh, on a scrimmage about what your team's going to be. But I do think you can 
determine whether some some individuals uh, can step up and help you who you need to step up and help. Yeah, for me, like I just kind of have a checklist. And, and again, you know for a fact that tempo is not going to be anywhere close to where Heibel wants it to be, and it shouldn't be. It's scrimmage number one. Um, but w- are they going fast? Are they going a respectable speed? Uh, especially with the first, you know, first team and some of those playmakers, are you? What's the turnovers look like? Are they forced? Or is there any interception on the defensive side? If so, good job defense. But no fumbled snaps, no fumbled exchanges, kind of minor things like that. What about the penalties? Any holding penalties? You want it to be clean, and it's not going to be perfect, but you want it to be clean. And then you know, on the on the on the flip side, kind of like what you guys said, looking for some individual play. Who's flashing? Uh, we, we've heard some good things lately. And again, I don't, I don't anticipate him being a huge factor this season. But when we talk about the depth. I mean, if you got some competition there at Star right now with Tamari McDonald, what's he look like coming out of the scrimmage today? So, you know, guys like that, some of these young guys, defensive linemen, are they flashing? That's kind of what I'm looking like. But just knowing that the offense isn't going to be anywhere close to what Hypo wants it to be because it is scrimmage number one and the tempo is not going to be nearly fast enough. That's nothing to get alarmed about, I guess. Well, if you got eight starters back on offense, you ought to be going pretty fast. Well, better than where you were scrimmage number one <laughs> I mean, last year, I guess. I, I, well, well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, compared to last year, I mean, last year they weren't even sure what a call was or trying to figure out to go left and right. But, I mean, I, I think that was the, a little bit of the disappointing thing we saw on the practice field on Sunday and Monday was that offensive passing game in routes versus air had been in such a nice rhythm the first week. They, were a little, they weren't great Sunday. Um, they weren't great on Monday. Do they get it back going? But but with the experience they have on offense, they should be clicking pretty good in, in scrimmage one. They they should be they should be up and running. Um, I won't say as fast as they want to go, but they should go fast enough that it puts a lot of stress on the defense with all those bodies coming back who have played in this system successfully as they did a year ago. And then too, some of those newcomers on defense. Uh, you know, I thought. First couple of practices when we were out there, I thought Andre Turntime made some plays. You know, he's he's at the safety position right now. Wesley Walker, what's he look like at the star position? So kind of a lot coming out of, of uh, scrimmage one that we can take. But I do think one thing's for certain, when Glenn Ellerby met with us last week with the media and asked about that left tackle position, he said he couldn't tell you who was ahead right now. Wants to have an idea coming out of scrimmage one. Wants it to be solidified in scrimmage two, which will come up Sunday. And then from there, you want that guy to get all the reps. So Hopefully, at least one of the things Josh Heupel could say, and of course he's got to review video and all that, but maybe they'll have an idea about is it JJ Crawford, is it Gerald Mincy, or do you have to scrap it, throw it away, and do something else? I think that's something that needs to be not resolved, but you got to have a good idea coming out of of later today. They're, they're both going to play against Ball State, you know. So, I mean, for me, it's like who who performs best in the, in that situation that moves into the to the to the pit game. I mean, they, they, they may have a starter, sure, but, like, I think they're both going to play. And depending on, you know, if just because Gerald Mincy starts the Bull State game doesn't mean he'll start the pit game or vice versa. Yeah, well, I think, I, I, go ahead, go ahead I was Rob. Just say, ideally, it's what you were talking about, however, you would, you'd like for both of those guys to prove that they can help you, even if you don't, you know, find out who the starter is for another week, just so you avoid the scenario you were talking about where you have to, you know, completely reshuffle the line and move Darnell to the left side and, you know, you don't you don't want to be doing that two 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 and a half weeks in the fall camp. No, I think you're exactly right. That's what I was going to say. I think you want to come out of this scrimmage later today and go, okay, Darnell's going to be fine at right tackle. We're going to stay right there because we we can win with a combination of those couple of those two guys or those three guys, whatever. And I think it's those two guys in Crawford and and Mincy over on the left side. So we can, you know, we don't have to go to option C. Because the option A or option B is going to be good enough for us to win. I think that's what you're hoping to accomplish to come out of of, of scrimmage number one. One other thing on the offensive line while we're here, and it's not crazy to have this question because again we talk about whenever you compare it to the rest of college football and everything. But I mean Tennessee has played a lot of offensive linemen last year, and they got by. And they continue to break records, and the offense scored 39 points a game, and you know it wasn't perfect. You know, give it too many sacks, but it, it was still pretty good. Uh, Ollie Lane's played an awful lot. Jackson Lampley's gotten a little bit of run. Is there depth-wise on the offensive line? Any, any concern there? Addison Nichols getting a look at guard a little bit with Jerome Carvin missing some time. What's the depth look like? Of course, Dane Davis there as well behind those front five. Well, it's better than it was because you've got guys who have played. Um, is it 
I mean, listen, Rob, when's the last time a coach said, we're really deep there? We're really deep at this position. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't happen. It, 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 you know, it, it just does Coaches just, I mean, they never have enough depth. But they're deeper than they were. I think, Austin, they probably are going to come out of this fall camp, if they stay healthy, that they're going to feel like they can probably line up and play with seven guys. Does that mean they're going to rotate and play seven in a game? I don't know about that, but I think they're going to feel like – Hey, we we can we can go. We are we're pretty comfortable playing uh, up to seven guys. Um, and then the question becomes: do, Does an eighth emerge, or, or what does that look like? Because I mean, clearly Ollie Lane can, can play. I think there's a lot of hope about where Addison Nichols is right now and how much he can continue to grow there at, at that position. Uh, Jackson Lampley, who, who you mentioned, I mean, they, they've got some bodies there um, that that should give them an opportunity to go. I think seven deep with, with this with this group, um, but the one concern obviously is is the tackle spot because you're not deep there, and you don't want to have any injury there. They can ill afford to get a tackle hurt. Um, they just don't have enough competition. They don't have enough depth there to to be that to be comfortable with an injury out there. And that's one of the things about this team uh, that I think was overlooked from a year ago. Austin, they didn't they didn't get a bunch of people hurt. No, you're you know? right. They didn't. They they stayed for the most part pretty healthy. I mean, they had a an ankle here or there, but it was nothing like season ending, you know, and I mean, I'm not even going there. <laughs> just, just move on. I don't know. I mean, just go. I'm not even jinxing anything. Don't go jinx on. It. Don't jinx it, AP. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, they, they played five guys in the secondary, 800, 800 or more snaps last year. But they could have played a lot more. They chose to do that. They, right. To me, that's where they, they really messed well, up. But, but, but my question is, so the question is, we're talking about these bodies and everything, and that's the point of this scrimmage and the Sunday scrimmage is who proves to the coaching staff, hey, you can play me. You can play me because they clearly got to week three of the season last year and said, I don't think I can play any of those guys, and this is who we're going to ride with. And they rode that horse till till it fell apart. Correct. You know? it, but I, mean, I remember it. I don't remember it was, it was it leaving Kentucky or leaving – it was – they don't even think it's Kentucky. It was some game last year, and you looked it up, and you said – my God, man, they were up by 40 points and they played mm -hmm. these got Theo Jackson played all but one snap. You know, Matthew Butler, like, like it, I get like rolling with your guys in those, like Rodney talked about, like in SEC games. But like, if you're up by 40 points against a non conference opponent or even like a Vanderbilt or like they played South Carolina last year where they just beat the tournament in the first half, what are you doing playing all these guys? I mean, like, the all, you should be able to build depth in those situations by getting those younger players who have not played in the football game because it does not matter. If they get beat, it's okay. It's one touchdown. You're still up 35. Like, yeah, you know, I just, I, I don't understand some of the kind of tendencies they get into to play guys when they're up 40. You I know, agree. I, and and I, I, I think the Bowling Green game last year is a great example of that. Uh, I mean, I don't think they played enough quarterbacks, you know. I know they were trying to get, I guess, Joe back in a better rhythm or whatever. But, um, you know, when, when you have those opportunities, save a guy's legs as a starter that you believe in and then that you know you can win with and build some guys. Play some guys and see what you got. I mean, that's that's the best testing ground is to play them in front of a, a, a group of fans when you're up five touchdowns. You don't want to run into a situation where you're playing Hendon Hooker in the fourth quarter when you're up by 35 points and running the football at Missouri. That's the one I'll hold on to forever. Like, what are you doing? Like, what's, I know Joe was a little banged up at that point in time, but goodness gracious, it made no sense. Um, I want to play this clip real quick from Rodney Garner. This was from Monday. A lot of, you know, a lot of Tennessee fans love him because of his old school mentality and everything, but Rodney Garner on his coaching style and what he's trying to get out of his player. A lot of times he says, listen to listen to the message, don't listen to the tone. Here's Rodney Gardner from Monday. Uh, well, like I tried to explain to the guys, you know, all I want from my players, I just want them to be the best version of them. You know, and, and, and obviously, you know, when they're in that moment, you know, it may not seem that way. It was just like I was talk I called them up at today after practice. You know, I'm coaching Tyree, I'm telling him something out there on the field, and oh, he gives you that look, like, whatever. And I'm like, dude, man, I just want you to be the best version of you, all right? When, when, you, when we get this look right here, this is what we're supposed to do, right? Am I right? 
well, you didn't do it. You know what? When we go up there and turn the film on, you know what? You didn't do it. All right. So, you know, so that is not, you know, I, I think so many times, you know, that they take it personal. And, you know, and I, and I try to tell them, you know, you know, I could be probably a little bit aggressive. You know, I can probably be a little brutal. I may not say it in the nicest way, but I try to tell them, don't take it the tone, you know, you know, receive the message, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, you know, take that aggression. It's, that's, that's just me wanting to win. That's just me wanting you to be better at times. You know, at the end of the day, though, 99% of my guys, they come back and they love me. I, you know, at that moment right now, they don't like me, which is sort of like being a parent, you know, your kids. Your kids don't like you when you raise them. But when they get old, they love you and they appreciate everything you did for them. I, that's what we're hoping that's going to the same thing that's going to transpire here. You know, that these guys are going to love me, you know, that they're going to bring their wives and the kids back to see me. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be playing with their kids like they're my grandkids, you know. So that's, that's what it's all about. And, you know, and, and just getting them to understand I want what's best for them. I want them to be the best version of themselves so we can be the best version of a Tennessee D-line and then we can be the best version of a Tennessee football team. That's all I want. You know, one of the interesting things about Rodney for me that I think gets overlooked or wasn't talked about is, yeah, he coaches hard, and he was talking about this. You know, they come back and they love you when they come back. Nobody has a full idea, a clear idea of how many former players came back last year to, to see Rodney Garner and to watch him coach in a game. I mean, Richard Seymour, who's going in the Hall of Fame, was back with his family just to see Rodney Garner. He doesn't care about Tennessee, but he came in to see his old coach. And I think that's a credit to Rodney Garner, and that's why his style ultimately has worked for 40-plus years. I mean, you got Derek Brown coming in this offseason. He and another guy that played at Penn State under Tim Banks, they both come in here and they trained at Tennessee. I mean, that, 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 and that's what you want. Like, you want – to be able to use your tentacles out there and I mean, have kids come in here and train, you know, cause I mean, Hey, what they go do, they're going to talk about how great Tim Banks is, how great Rondi Garner is, how great Josh Heupel is or whoever. And they just continue to uh, cause the buy-in to get stronger and stronger with the current team because they see how much they love these guys that they are now in a different place and different location. And they're showing up to see them and, and, and get work in. He said 99% of his former players come back, hang out with him. He plays with the kids like it's their own grandkids. So uh, when you've been doing it for 30 years in the SEC, you must obviously be doing something, Rob. But I, I love that quote. I thought that was a great – I mean, it's two minutes long. Uh, I thought it was a great, great answer. Uh, a couple minutes left real quick. Let's give you, Austin, and uh, anything of notes in the recruiting world. Jordan Matthews, Ricky Gibson, that cornerback position. Obviously, Tennessee needs to bring in another, if not two. Yeah, well, we – we were the first to talk about it on Sunday night, you know, that there had been a shift in the wind with Ricky Gibson. And uh, you saw more and more, you know, predictions or whatever roll in for Tennessee the last 24 hours. So, you know, Tennessee has is, is, uh, done a nice job there. And, and I think, you know, more than anything, I think just some people around Ricky kind of help him realize, hey, you know, you're wanting to play early. Quickest path to the field is Knoxville not necessarily going to Georgia. You're, you know, maybe getting caught up and, you know, playing for the defending national champs, you know, is maybe not in your best interest. And so I think, you know, Willie Martinez and company have, have done, have did a really nice job in June. Kind of, you know, Georgia got a little bit of momentum, but it looks like Tennessee's gotten it back before uh, the Sunday decision coming up uh, Sunday. And then Jordan Matthews, I mean, I'll just continue to, you know, beat the drum. People can talk about, Texas and stuff. And, and again, I think this is a Texas Tennessee battle. Um, there's no doubt it's between those two. Um, but the people, I think people are not giving Tennessee enough credit in this recruitment, um, in my opinion. So, you know, that one's got one, uh, basically one week from yesterday. So you're looking at six days until he pulls the trigger, um, at his high school. So, you know, I continue to feel like, you know, Tennessee is right there with Texas. So Jordan Matthews and Ricky Williams will be off the board here soon. Tennessee's still swinging hard there, and there will be other names to enter the mix, obviously, as the fall goes on. All right, so big day coming up later today. Scrimmage number one. Josh Heupel is going to be with the media shortly thereafter, depending on what time you're listening to this podcast. Maybe it is already in the rearview mirror, but fall camp is in full swing. Scrimmage one about to be in the books. Scrimmage two coming up on Sunday and plenty 
uh, practice coverage, highlights, two-minute drills, observations, all that and more. It's up on the site and on the YouTube channel. So say, subscribe, follow, like, comment, share, all that. The VolQuest YouTube channel each and every day. Big thanks to Smoky Mountain Organics for making this podcast possible. Three locations in East Tennessee, one in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Trader's Joe's, most trusted health and wellness store here in East Tennessee for natural products and organic remedies. That is Smoky Mountain Organics. All right, for Rob Lewis, Brent Hubs, Austin Price, I'm Eric Kane. Thanks so much for hanging out with us here today and listening to us right here on the VolQuest podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest podcast every week here on VolQuest.